Not good. Like. All right. You folks. Um. <laughs> Hey folks, um, thank you everyone for coming to Gary's uh, thesis defense. The plan for the defense is for the first 30 minutes or so, Gary will present his thesis. During this time, uh, please do not ask questions, wait till the end. After he finished giving, giving his oral presentation, um, we'll first open up the questions for the committee and then for the remaining uh, people in the audience. After that is done, um, we'll ask everyone except for the committee to leave. So the committee will deliberate and then we'll bring Gary in and uh, give the verdict. Okay, welcome um, so Gary again. Thank you everybody for coming to watch me present the research that I've been working on for the past year or so. Looking at the question, does cycling cadence affect inner limb asymmetry in pedaling power in individuals with Parkinson's disease? So first I'd like to give a little bit of an introduction on Parkinson's disease. It is a very common progressive neuromuscular disease. It's only second to Alzheimer's disease. And there is currently no cure. Um, methods are around to alleviate the symptoms and basically improve the quality of life for individuals. And that is what's costing the US healthcare system roughly $14 billion annually. It is caused by the degeneration of dopamine producing uh, cells within the basal ganglia of the brain in the substantia nigra. And the basal ganglia is responsible for cognitive function, voluntary movement, emotion, things like that. And when the dopamine cells start to degenerate, you start to get the cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's disease, which are bradykinesia or akinesia, so a slowing of movement, lack thereof movement. Resting tremors, so when the individual is unconsciously or not using a limb, uh, you might notice it start to shake a little bit. Um, but if you, for instance, ask them to grab a cup, those resting tremors seem to go away, but then again, they come back when unconsciously using the limb. Rigidity, so a tightness within the muscles, increased muscular tone. And then postural imbalances. Um, some of those signs can be a arched over um, posture, um, increased flexion of the thoracic spine and of the cervical. So generally, Parkinson's affects one side of the body more than the other. And this leads to interlimb inter asymmetry, which is asymmetry between the two limbs um, during motor tasks. And this places asymmetrical stresses on um, lower extremities, in this case, such as in cycling and walking, um, but it's task dependent, so it can be on upper extremities too, depending on the task. And cycling is a very common mode of neurorehabilitation. Generally, when for cycling to be beneficial in individuals with Parkinson's, cadences need to be faster. And that's generally around the 80 to 90 revolutions per minute. And the improvement in symptomology are of those cardinal symptoms I talked about. So decrease in bradykinesia, in rigidity, um, an increase in postural balance. But in the research that looks, on, looks at cadence, when they tell them to self-select a cadence, those cadences are generally lower, roughly around 60 revolutions per minute. So interlimb asymmetry in cycling, there's only been one current study that we found that looked at interlimb asymmetry in individuals with Parkinson's disease while cycling. cycling. And that was done by researchers Panko et al. And in this study, they did a incremental test, a graded exercise test. And during this test, they had the individual self-selected cadence, which they chose that self-selected cadence to control throughout the study. Um, and then every few minutes increased the power output that they performed. 
and they found that inner limb asymmetry was present in individuals with Parkinson's, um, and also that less power was exerted by their more severely affected limb, meaning that their less affected limb was working harder than their severely so, more affected. On, in research on younger, healthier individuals, pedaling at faster cadences did reduce asymmetry, so that led us to the question, would we see the same trends in individuals with Parkinson's? And would they demonstrate less inner limb asymmetry when cycling at faster speeds? So the purpose of my research was to examine the effects of pedaling cadence on inner limb asymmetry in, of the power output in individuals with Parkinson's disease when compared to healthy and age sex match controls. We had two different hypotheses, hypotheses while um, going over this study. The first one was that inner limb asymmetry would be more um, present in the individuals with Parkinson's than the healthy controls. And the second one was that inner limb asymmetry in power output would decrease at faster cadences. So we selected three cadences, 50, 65, and 80. Um, the 50 and 65 is the range that I mentioned before, which uh, individuals generally choose during their self-selected. And then 80 was in that range of revolutions per minute that um, benefits were present at. So we chose uh, cadences that were both in the self-selected and in the beneficial range. So this was a case study. We only had four participants, and here's a table that looks at those. So the first two participants right here were pair one. They were the same age, 67 years old. And the second pair right there were 70. They were all females. And on the y-axis here, you can see that we also recorded their height, their mass, their stage of Parkinson's disease, which is uh, the Hohen and Yar scale is a range. Um, and so each of the individuals were in that two to three range which are the mild, mild to moderate um, intent or severity, and then how long they've had the disease too. So two primary instruments were used during this study. The first one was a electronically braked Velotron cycle ergometer. And this instrument has been used or has been shown to be a valid and reliable measurement of power output in, um, during cycling. And then the second instrument was a Sensix force pedal system, which measures uh, power output in the anterior, posterior, medial, lateral, um, those tangential forces, as well as the normal forces. And it also indicates how the pedals are spinning at any point in time, as well as where they are in the crank cycle. Before each participant came, we made sure to validate or calibrate the Velotron using an AccuWatt calibration test um, and that we made sure that the, there was no deviation from the factory settings, no more than 0.5%. And we made sure to initialize the force pedals before every participant came to, um, according to the recommendations by the manufacturer. The procedure for the data collection was the same in all of the participants, except um, for the individuals with Parkinson's, they had two extra tasks to complete. The first one was before they were allowed to participate, they had to get clearance from their neurologist. Um, we used the YMCA's Pedaling for Parkinson's medical screening form for that, and this was to make sure that they didn't have any prior cardiac health problems before coming in and that the neurologist approved of their participation. And then after the study, within four weeks of the study, or of their data collection, they had to visit a local neurologist, Dr. Bruce McKay, to determine their grade of Parkinson's, again using that Hohen and Yar scale that I mentioned, and to see which side of their body was more affected. Now, it's important to note that during their visit with Dr. McKay, they had to be off medication for at least 12 hours. Um, so we found that it's best if they took their nightly medication and then before taking their morning medication, they saw him so that they didn't have to go throughout the day without being on medication.
And then once they were, so from here on, everything was the same for everyone else. So they came in, signed an informed consent, and then we collected demographic information such as the height and weight. Um, we got information on their cycling uh, history as well as other exercise history. Um, and then we gave them specialized shoes that clip into the pedals. And a bike fit was performed to normalize their posture. And this posture was 30 degrees of knee flexion and trunk flexion. So we adjusted the seat height to adjust for their knee flexion and handlebar height for their trunk flexion. And then when the pedals were horizontal, we used a plumb line to make sure that the bottom of their patella matched with the uh, pedal spindle. And this was done for all of the individuals. And that um, pedal spindle matching was done by changing the bike seat fore aft position. So once they came in and after the bike fit was done, they did a three to five minute warm up. And during the warm up, it was a self selected workload as well as a self selected cadence. And during this time, we also familiarized them with the Bellatron system that they would be looking at. And it's this blue screen over here. And the only part that they had to pay attention to, if you can see this dark blue triangle on the right, when they pedaled at faster cadences, the triangle would move up and slower they would move down. And since all of the different conditions were at a fixed cadence, we made sure that um, they were able to maintain it right there at the middle, um, deviating no more than one tick, which each tick was a revolution per minute um, above and below. So after the warm up, then the pedaling conditions began, and there were six three minute conditions. And then after those conditions, they did a cool down for three to five minutes, similar to the uh, warm up. So the data was then analyzed. So the data for the pedal forces and the crank power output was filtered using using 4 hertz, which is similar in other studies that we looked at. And the data for crank power output was then, for the lower extremities, was then averaged over 60 crank cycles. We then took that average and we put it into a symmetry index. Now this symmetry index is the same one that was used by the study I mentioned before by Penko et al. And the equation shows for the top one is for the individuals with Parkinson's, and then the bottom one is structured the same, but for the individuals in the control group. Um, so we used their unaffected limb and their affected limb power outputs. And for the control, we used their dominant and non-dominant limb. Um, one thing to mention with the symmetry index is that a index of 0% means that they're symmetrical and any higher indicates asymmetry. And with the equation used, a positive number indicates for the individuals with Parkinson's that they used more power output from their unaffected limb, and for the controls, that they used more power in their dominant limb. And that is evidenced in the results that we found. So I'm going to start with the preferred workload, so their self-selected cadence. On the y-axis, we were looking at the symmetry index. And for the X is our controlled cadences, so 50, 65, and 80. Like I mentioned, a 0% symmetry index indicates that they are more symmetrical. And our the blue is the individuals with Parkinson's, and the red are the controls. Now, the first graph on the left is for the first pair, so the two individuals who were 67. And the graph on the right is for the individuals who were 70. Now, two things I'd like to mention here. The first one matched our first hypothesis that the individuals with Parkinson's would show a greater degree of asymmetry than the uh, control group. So you can see that the controls are closer to that 0% line, and the individuals with Parkinson's are well above that. And then our second one, which didn't match our second hypothesis, was that as you increased cadence, the um, symmetry index would go down. So we even saw the trend that it went up. That also indicates that the individuals were using, since it's a greater positive number, they were using more of their less affected limb and relying less and less on their severely affected side. 
And then the next graph is, it's structured the same, so I'll just go into the data, but it's for the fixed 60 watt workload. And similar trends are shown that individuals with Parkinson's um, exhibit a greater degree of asymmetry. Um, but as the cadence increased, we didn't see trends indicating a change um, from that cadence. So these next graphs show the same thing, but instead of the symmetry index, we are looking at relative power output. So we have the bluer colors, the darker blue for the individuals with Parkinson's, their less affected side, and the lighter is their more severely affected side. And then the reds, we have the darker red, the dominant limb, and the lighter red, the non-dominant. And we drew a line at 50% to show that if an individual exhibited 0% asymmetry, then both of those limbs should be contributing 50% to the total power output. So you can see that the individuals with Parkinson's have a much higher degree of asymmetry and that they rely more on their less affected side. So for example, this first 50 cadence um, condition, the individual used roughly 75-76% of their less affected side and only 25 to 26% of their non-affected side. And as the cadences increased, they relied less and less on their more affected side. And similarly, that was shown in the fixed workload with individuals with Parkinson's showing a greater degree of asymmetry and no clear trend with an increase in cadence. So like I mentioned, our data supported our first hypothesis that inner limb asymmetry would be greater in individuals with Parkinson's than the controls. And here we just show the raw data. So for the index of asymmetry in individuals with Parkinson's, that was a range of roughly 35 to 154%. And for the controls, that was a range of only 1 to 34%. Now, similar, this data is similar to research, other research on inner limb asymmetry in individuals with Parkinson's. Like I mentioned before, the study done by Panko, their ranges were from 20% to 120%, so similar to what we found. But other motor tasks also showed inner limb asymmetry. For example, a gait study done by Yoga Vidal found that individuals with Parkinson's disease during a um, normal walking test, so they had them walk normally, and then they also had dual um, walking tasks, which incorporated a cognitive side to it. But they found that the individuals with Parkinson's had a greater degree of asymmetry than their controls. And a balance study done by Boonstra et al. was similar where they were looking at, they had them stand on a, basically a force plate that um, gave them slight perturbations in their standing and they um, looked at their balance. They used the Hohn and Yar scale for their measurement um, and for their asymmetry differences, but they also found that the individuals with Parkinson's had a greater degree of asymmetry. So like I mentioned, Parkinson's affects one side of the body more than the other. It, as it progresses, it becomes, or it starts out more unilaterally affecting one side, but as it be progresses, it begins to become more bilateral. But one thing to know is when it does become bilateral, it's still not even. So it's affecting both sides, but not to an even degree. And these are shown by both sensory and motor um, aspects. So the sensory side, is shown as a reduction in their sensation, um, their joint position sense, and their proprios proprioception on their more affected side. And then those motor aspects are what I mentioned, the symptomology, the bradykinesia, rigidity, um, postural imbalance, resting tremors. And those as a whole, both the uh, motor and the sensory, are shown as a inner limb asymmetry, either in the upper extremities or lower extremities. So data from this study and other studies may suggest that Parkinson's could be a cardinal symptom, cardinal feature of, or of Parkinson's manifested in those different motor tasks such as cycling um, in the study and others, as well as walking, standing balance, and other lower extremity um, coordination tasks. 
So with the limited data that we collected, hypothesis two was not supported. That being that inner limb asymmetry would be higher for the lower cases, and as we increased, it would the asymmetry would decrease. And we give data here for the preferred <coughs> workload, and we didn't include data for the PowerPoint for a fixed workload since we saw the similar trends. But as you see, what we saw with our individuals with Parkinson, as we increased the cadence, their asymmetry actually went up. But for the controls, there was no clear trend with a change, a systematic change in cadence. So with other research on asymmetry, for younger cyclists, for healthier individuals, asymmetry did become less pronounced at faster cadences. Um, but in older, in older healthy individuals, as well as individuals with other injuries or diseases, such as um, knee osteoarthritis, we found that asymmetry was actually unaffected by cadence, and changing the cadence didn't have a clear trend on asymmetry. So piling that all together, we saw no consistent effect of cadence on symmetry in pedaling. So I mentioned again before in the introduction that for individuals with Parkinson's, therapeutic benefits are observed at faster cadences. Um, those are, again, an improvement in the motor response as well as the cortical response. And for patients with Parkinson's, they may be highly symmetrical in cycling. And this large amount of inner limb asymmetry could subject the less affected side to greater efforts, greater stresses, um, and it would also suggest that if they are in a neurorehabilitative setting, that the more affected side is getting less of a workout, and it's basically working less. Like we saw in the results, as the cadence increased, the less or the more affected, severely affected side was working to a less degree than the more affected. So data from this study and others could suggest that a strong need, or there is a strong need for monitoring symmetry in effort during exercises such as cycling for individuals with Parkinson's disease. And that if we provided them with some sort of biofeedback um, about their differences so they know which side is more affected, um, with, to what degree their limbs are working differently, then they could either structure their neurorehabilitation to promote more of a symmetrical exercise for both sides. So the largest limitation to the study was the sample size. Um, like I mentioned, this was a case study, so we only looked at four individuals, um, and everything was given as a descriptive analysis. But in order to find the st uh, statistics of it, then we would need to collect more data. So to summarize, um, back to our first hypothesis that we supported individuals with the Parkinson's disease did, did show a greater degree of asymmetry than the healthy age sex, sex match controls. And the second hypothesis that wasn't supported that um, there was no clear effect of cadence with a increase, or there was no effect of a faster cadence on asymmetry for the individuals with Parkinson's disease. So I would like to thank my thesis committee, Drs. Budadev, Sanwan, and Subrak for all the help they gave me, especially um, Dr. Budadev, been very supportive with all of them on the way. Um, I would also like to thank the um, local neurologist, Dr. Bruce McKay, who took time out of his schedule to see these individuals and assess their Parkinson's for us. As well as all of you, family and friends, uh, thank you for all of the support that you've given me in the past year. Love you all. Thank you. So, thank you all. Now I'll open up the floor to the committee first for questions and then others. Okay, so, the committee members can go first. I'll go first. Yeah. All right. So first of all, great job. Thank you. And it's apparent that you uh, know what you're talking about, which is probably the most important part of it. Um, I did have a couple questions. First of mm -hmm. all, um, 
So you increase cadence at a given power output or a fixed or or a um, self-selected self-selected power output, right? Or a fixed power output? Yes, yeah, the two different conditions. Yeah. And um, what have you seen in, in looking at increasing power output but keeping the cadence the same? Right. Um, so that's one thing I wanted or we didn't look at, but we did see that if I'm going to go back to our results that we found. But one thing with increase in power output, which this is what um, the Panko study was directly looking at, and we saw similar trends that with the preferred workload, the individuals with Parkinson's, they had lower, um, they chose a lower self-selected, I think it was in the 30 to 40 range. and you can notice as you increase that workload, their asymmetry decreased. So for example, the first pair, there was roughly the 100 to 150 range, but it's closer to 100. And it was more drastic in the second pair, which is again above 100, but with an increase in power output, we saw that decrease to the below 50%. Um, so with what we found as well as other studies that would indicate that higher power outputs are also necessary to get those changes? Mm -hmm. Is that your question? Yeah, and then I thought when I was reading uh, either your introduction or your discussion, you were talking about there was a study that was looking at um, an increased cadence, at least in healthy people, yeah. decreased uh, the asymmetry. Right. But it sounded, it looked like to me that the cadences in that particular study were higher than in the two, right? Yes, yeah, for the health, or for the healthy studies, the cadences were generally higher. Okay. Do you think that the, the cadences, if you um, increase it above this, what do you think? Right. So we were, we structured ours um, similar to those done in neurorehabilitation settings. So we got all of our participants actually from the Pedaling for Parkinson's class at the YMCA's, and they structured theirs um, around the 80 to 90. So they make sure that they pedal at least there. Um, we haven't directly looked at, and most studies didn't go above that. Um, so we are unsure if higher cadences um, would elicit the same response as the younger cyclists, but with the data that we have, we are unsure. This trend doesn't look like it. No, no, not at all. Uh, okay, why did you analyze 60 cycles? Um, so we felt that 60 cycles gave a good representation of the power output that we were looking at. Um, some other studies had less than that, some had a lot less than that, but some had more. So we chose the 60 cycles because we felt like that gave a good representation to average out and find a power output. Um, and then, um, you talked about that the other articles have consistently shown that using cycling can improve symptoms for people with right. Parkinson's, right? And your cadences, how do they compare to those that they used in those? Um, so for most of the other studies, they had self-selected cadences, which um, they didn't direct, in some of the studies we looked at, they didn't represent the cadences, they didn't give it to that, but they mentioned that they were self-selected, and with that information along with the research that says self-selected is generally lower um, in the range that I gave, then um, for those self-selected cadences, they were lower, again, in that 50 to 65 range. And then I think the last, right. oh, okay. boy. Um, just one last thing, when you said, uh, and this is very, very small, when you're talking about the four pedals, and then, do they measure power, or do they just measure force? They, they measure forces, but yeah. they also have crank and quarter and pedal and quarter, so it actually calculates power. Okay. It calculates the Cal power. Yeah, it, calcul it calculates yeah. power output. I'm sorry. Yeah. So it measures Obviously the forces, very, very but we want to be careful. calculations yeah. give out power output. Right. Okay. That's all I have. Is there anyone? Great job, Greg. I know there's a lot of complications in this right. question which made it. Um, so the first one is more of a technical question. You, you mentioned that you filtered um, power output right. and the force. Right. And on your write-up, you also add crank position and pedal orientation. Right. 
So why do you need to filter it and why did you choose that four hertz? Or um, four hertz? So the four hertz was chosen um, based off of previous research um, done by Dr. Brudadev as well as um, a hunt study that we looked at also. And so we felt like this four hertz was um, sufficient enough to filter the data. And um, this was to assure, since the data that we collected goes through, let me reword this. So it's not direct from when they push on the pedal, it has to go through the system again, do those calculations before the data is given to us on the computer. Um, so we had to filter the data basically to alleviate the extraneous noise to get Trying to see how to word this. I need my train of thought on the wording. But... Yeah. No. Just trying to think how we, why we filtered it like that. But yeah. Um. So basically, to filter the data. Um, since we were collecting over a large period of space to basically make sure that all of the data that we collected was similar that, I don't know if that answers the question, really. Was it? Yeah. Just think about it, just yeah. like, just, you know, you put it out in the air and then you have to figure out you know, the reasoning behind it. Yeah. Right. And then, the main green variable here that you're looking at is power output from right. cables, right? So right. those are the two main variables. Right. And when you are collecting data with different subjects, mm -hmm. you know that they'll have different height, right? And so they'll have different um, lower limb length. Right. So do you think lower limb length would affect the cadence and output? And if it does, how can you address that? Um, so I'm, we're unsure if lower limb height, since we most of the data doesn't look directly at that, but um, that's why we normalized everyone with a bike fit um, so that they were all showing 30 degrees at the knee, 30 degrees at the trunk. Um, so we normalized to take into account that everyone does have different heights. And then what was your other question to that? So what, what do you think if somebody has a, uh, a higher or longer, longer lower limb, limb yeah. would they have a lower or higher cadence, lower or higher power output, or mm -hmm. is it not going to affect it? Um, if, it's, if it affects it, how can you, and I think, you know, how can you normalize it? Right. So that could be something that um, is taken into account in future research. Um, in terms of the research that we looked at where I don't even think most of the research um, mentioned, like they gave their height and weight, but they don't, besides that, they don't make any note on that. So it is unsure. If their lower limbs are longer, there's gonna be biomechanically um, some differences, but in terms of self-selected cadence as well as uh, self-selected power output or how cadence is going to affect that, um, it really is unsure, but that is something that can be monitored. It's something easy that could easily that could be monitored in future research. Would be something, yeah. And then last one uh, from your discussion is said that um, this data suggests that asymmetry uh, suggests that there's some. I lost it. Wait, what's it? <coughs> this. Yeah, so you're saying that, yeah, asymmetry is probably a cardinal feature of um, key units and so Right. So why do you think that's happening? Um, due to it be it begins unilaterally, generally in that Hohen and Yars two to three stage, um, it's more pronounced on one side, and it begins unilaterally, so it starts out as basically then becoming more asymmetrical um, with those cardinal symptoms that I mentioned um, their balance, their posture, all of that, um, it begins asymmetri asymmetrically. So 
it could be one of those cardinal features that definitely needs to be monitored, especially if they are doing some sort of rehab where they're trying to get their morphic inside worked out, but also not putting a lot of stress on their less affected limb. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I have three questions from here. All righty. Okay. Keep talking about power output. You could have measured many other things. Why did you choose power output as your dependent? Um, we chose power output because um, in terms of cycling, power output um, shows the effort of the lower extremity. So it's a pretty direct measurement of the effort of the lower extremity. Um, if we go to the slide about... Oh. That one. Oh, this first one. Okay. So anything about zero is asymmetry, right? Um, what number is meaningful asymmetry? Right. So after what number would you say this is something that's meaningful right. and significant? So in the research that we looked at, generally that range was fairly low. So about 10% um, asymmetry is like, everyone has some degree of asymmetry that generally doesn't affect our day-to-day -day life. Um, you can see with the controls, they have some degree, but 10% was the range that was given that as you increase above 10%, it becomes more detrimental. So these individuals with Parkinson's, you can see they're tenfold there. Um, last question. This is uh, revisiting Dr. Sufrak's question. Um, so Penko et al., when they did their study, they systematically increased power Right. But at cell selected cadences. Right. His question was Has anyone done a study where they keep cadence the same for everyone and then they systematically change power output and see how the relative asymmetry is affected? Has such a study been conducted? Um, there were some studies by Rigel, so I didn't mention their names, but Rigel are also some other um, individuals who've done a lot of research on Parkinson's disease and they've been looking at cycling too. And in some of these, their studies, they did have self or they did have controlled cadences. But did they manipulate power output and look at internal asymmetry? They did not. Okay. That's, well, those were my questions, and now uh, we will open up the questions for the conference. Yes. You, when you were testing, did you look at um, what their dominant side was? Like, did you look at like so not the side that was affected, but did you look at like which uh, which uh, which limb were they dominant? Um. So. We didn't directly look at that, but we did take note. So we asked all of our participants which um, leg was dominant and non-dominant, <laughs> but we did not look at that. So we didn't monitor if their, you know, dominant side was their more affected or if their dominant okay. side less affected. That was going to be my next question. So that's awesome. Okay, cool. Yes. We have to run to class, but there are a couple of things I was thinking of, sort of going up with Dr. Tenmon was saying, mm -hmm. and you tried to use bike fit to account for some structural right. differences. Did you monitor the trunk at all? Because what you have is a very degree angle. Mm -hmm. What about the thoracic angle? Right. What about the you know lateral deviation that they might have? Right, they so we didn't monitor that. We um, did make sure that everyone was cycling similarly in terms of keeping both hands on the bike at all time to sort of account for that, but we didn't monitor if they were Increasing thoracic or cervical. Um, no, we did not. Because that might have a difference on pain perception. Right. And then I was just saying about the lateral because if you're pushing heavier you're on pushing one side. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't, again, we didn't monitor for that. Um, but I see what you mean. If they're starting to lean to either alleviate pain or if that's their natural way, then they would be pushing more on one side and that could. Also, for the that's how you generate more force. What was that? You're using that mass to generate more force. Right. So that's sort of the biomechanics thing that they should look at. Exactly. Yeah. Anybody have a question? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Are there any other questions? If not, I'll uh, request everyone to leave the lab. It's very if you take a camera or two. Yeah. We don't want the